problems. And uh, we speak a lot about that uh, topic because uh, this is something without what the Ukrainian economy cannot develop anymore. And our society cannot develop. And that's what our, our future depends on. Now, topic, urgency and the priorities uh, for the reforms in Ukraine. We'll speak to our uh, respect, uh, honors, uh, speaker, Sir Roger Meyerson. Laureate of uh, Nobel Prize in Economic uh, Sciences in uh, 2007, Mr. Yuri Lohos, uh, President of K uh, Kiev School of Economics and uh, representatives of uh, Vox Ukraine Editorial Board at Mifim Lovanova and Olena Bilan. Now, during this roundtable, during this uh, press conference, we'll speak about reforms under conditions of crisis an economy and uh, because of and uh, because of uh, uh, or in the e uh, in the east and uh, results of, as a result of our uh, roundtable there will be proposals as uh, to reforms and uh, in the form of an open letter which will be sent to the president of ukraine and also to the, uh, the prime minister after we are done with the press conference We'll give you phone numbers and contacts uh, for more detail, to, to get more detailed information, and now we can begin. And I'll invite uh, our first uh, speaker, Mr. Roger Meyerson. I would like to remind uh, he is uh, an American economist and who, together with Daniel Gurwitz and Eric Maskin, uh, he received uh, the Prime of Swedish uh, Bank on Economic Sciences and uh, after Nobel, Af Alfred Nobel. Please, the floor is yours, Mr. Roger. Maybe we can, we can change well, this a little bit. Allow yeah, me. I think we can change we can, the, the, the line, uh, and Dobre. I think we can change the line. Just to show you the line, Mr. Meyerson. I would like to introduce. I would like to uh, say a little bit about Kiev School of Economics. Uh, that is the leading school of economics in Ukraine, and uh, we organized a forum and. Uh, comprehensive forum about the reforms and the horizontal uh, vertical reforms and we work with uh, the, uh, the ministries and the civic groups on uh, uh, February 24 a long time ago but not long time ago there was an organization uh, of Vox Ukraine they found it and uh, the goal is uh, to unite all the forces uh, who work for the reforms and uh, to pre to prepare proposal to, uh, to give uh, analysis and uh, to support uh, to give to provide all academic support for the reforms uh, to be precise predictable and uh, good and the colleagues will speak about that and um, this is, uh, I will finish my short uh, speech and inv invite Roger Marson who is uh, Nobel Memorial uh, Prize uh, Nobel Laureate, and he will speak about uh, reforms to you. And uh, the issue for today, uh, also decentralization. We understand this is uh, not a, a simple solution. One of the best economists in, in uh, on the planet. He will he will share his uh, thoughts about about this. Thank you very much, Mr. Myerson. I, uh, I'm an, I am an economist who studies uh, the specialty of game theory, which means I study how in the rules of institutions affect the ability of people to, to build trust with each other and to cooperate effectively in, in markets and in, and in politics, I, which means I read constitutions, for example. It was seven years ago that I, I was first introduced to some of the unique and I think problematic features of centralization in the, in the Constitution of Ukraine. Uh, three years ago I wrote a piece uh, in which I argued uh, in response to something that Yulia Timshenko had written in, in Al Jazeera, I, that, that, that in understanding the difficulties of building successful democracy in Ukraine and in understanding the difficulties that she was writing about of the, the challenges then facing the Arab Spring, which was the subject of her article in Al Jazeera, that one should not neglect the important questions of the distribution of power between nationally elected leaders and locally elected leaders. Decentralization needs to be an important question, I argued. Uh, it was not surprising to me that my article three years ago was not of any particular interest. Uh, uh, I may be a senior economist of some reputation, but, but obviously I was writing about um, problems of other parts of the world. Today, the crises of Ukraine this year have made it a, have raised the questions 
and I have no greater privilege as a, as a senior economist than to, part, to, to participate in your discussions as a foreigner, and I can, all I can do is testify some expertise that in thinking about reforms in this country, you need to think about what is connected with what. What, what kinds of structures in the Constitution, for example, have what kinds of effects that, and an economist should be helping to point that out for the discussions, and that's what I hope to bring here, and it's been a privilege to talk with, with people in Ukraine about this. My argument in brief was that I saw s some important disadvantages of the system of decentralization in Ukraine, in particular, the, it's complicated and I will only say a little bit, I can't say much now, but I want to say that the particular form of centralization in Ukraine was that since 2004, the Constitution has been written to give the Prime Minister, who is responsible to the Verkhovna Rada, give the Prime Minister pr responsibility, primary responsibility for the national government, but gives the president primary responsibility for overseeing all local administrations. I have argued that when you think about that, that simple structure, having a popularly elected president whose greatest direct power is his ability to direct local administrations in, in some 24 different provinces or oblasts of the country and in districts, in, in hundreds of districts across the country, that that structure itself tends to create a politics, a national politics, which is highly regionally, uh, um, creates antagonism, is, is, is designed, is, is almost designed to create antagonism between regions. Uh, the most important connections I have tried to make were one, that in countries that have decentralized democracy, let me back up and say, I, I was trying to respond to questions about when demo a country has successfully tr made a transition from an authoritarian rule to democracy, but the quality of democratic government still seems deeply dissatisfying to a large fraction of the voters. What's wrong? The, one of my, the best answers I can give to all countries based on, th on, on an analysis of, of, of the logic of constitutional democracy and on comparative politics across the world is that in successful democracies, democratic competition at the national level is broadened by local democracy. Voters in many countries, when they look at, the, the, at who are their, leader, their, their candidates for national leadership who are taken seriously, in many countries, the, some of the best candidates are people who have proven themselves first by being elected as governor or head of a provincial administration or a large city, or mayor of a large city in Indonesia, in Italy, in, uh, in, in, uh, in India this year, people who had previously been mayors of large cities or governors of important provinces became competitive presidents or prime ministers of, of the country, and that's typical. So the first argument I've tried to make is to recognize that when you, one of the effects of decentralization would be to allow more opportunities for politicians to prove the quality of what they can do for the people of Ukraine by control by by having been elected to responsible office at the provincial, municipal, or district level. The second major connection I'd want to make in this year of difficulty is to recognize that although decentralization seems to weaken the state in some ways, in some very important ways, a decentralization reform can actually strengthen a state against the problems of separatism or insurgency. When all power in a, cover, in a, in a nation is allocated by a majority vote, democratically, but at the national level, because the government is completely centralized, 
And even the decentralized offices in, in this country are under supervision of a president who is nationally elected by national popular vote. You raise the possibility, which I think you may have seen, that there may be a large portion of the country in which all the voters feel, all the citizens, the local leaders and the local voters en masse, feel that they did not participate in the coalition that chose the national government, and therefore they feel you can have regions where nobody feels they have any particular stake in the political system of the country. Decentralization, and by decentralization I typically mean most countries somewhere between a third and less than a half, somewhere between a third and a half of public spending is together at the provincial, district, and municipal levels, the sub-national level. In a decentralized political system, you guarantee that in every province there are local people, local leaders who are elected by popular support, therefore they have broad popular support in their communities, and they have broad responsibilities to, to, to spend public money to serve the, their communities, and therefore have a vested interest in the perpetuation, the preservation and perpetuation of the political system of this country, which is what it takes to resist separatist and insurgent. Uh, so that connection between better government at the national level from decentralization of government, the decentralization can make national political democracy more competitive, the decentralization can strengthen the, gov the, 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 the political system against uh, against separatism are two connections I want to make. We should recognize that there are vital interests that the, the, the people at the national government have, have, have a vested interest in the current system, so decentralization is difficult. Let me say finally two sentences. One, that in a transition to a, a, a decentralization, the most important voices are not, of course, those of foreign professors, but of one of the national leaders who are going to, by, under the Constitution, write the reform, but I would hope that would be in dialogue, and the Ukrainian people should want to hear the voices of those patriotic representatives who are already elected, who have already been elected to provincial councils and district councils in all parts of Ukraine. The powers of their councils will be affected by a decentralization. They have an interest and they should be part of the national dialogue in crafting the decentralization, the questions, in, in addressing the questions of constitutional reform for decentralization in Ukraine. Finally, I would say that, of course, a foreign professor has no vote. Foreign heads of state have no vote. Uh, and whatever the, 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 the the President of Russia may say, I would like to say that most of the arguments I have made to the benefits of democracy, of, of decentralized democracy, should also apply equally, or at least in some form, to Russia, that the Russian national democracy would be improved, I would like to say, if the December 2004 ref uh, reform, which gave the President of Russia the power to appoint governors in, in, in Russia, that should also be a question that I hope the President of Russia will address when he talks about the virtues of decentralization in Ukraine. Thank you so much, Mr. Myers. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Myers. I invite uh, Mr. Milovanov, Vox, uh, Vox Ukraine. Thank you very much. I want to the rep uh, representative of uh, Fox Ukraine editorial uh, board. It's a group of economists and all Ukrainians, and we have eight of us and four of us uh, globals. So they um, live and work in the US, uh, so in Europe, and four are locals, very influential. Very good reputation. Olena Bilan, Metro Solkup, Metro Berchuk, and Renika Mochan. With uh, Global, so Yuri Nihornichenko, Volodymyr Bilotkaj, and uh, Alexander Talavera, and myself. We are trying to do the following. We want to raise the level of debates or discourse as to reforms in Ukraine. What is happening in Ukraine is there are a lot of discussions about reforms, but they are ad hoc. They are not systemic. There are some legislations. 
Nobody, there are discussions about around uh, drone flows and uh, whatever. When we, just, when we see how they are linked with each other, that's why we're trying to to, to bring uh, uh, people like uh, Roger uh, Myers, uh, Jan Sweena, Ivan Miklos, General Rollins, uh, people who from the West and who are working with us. We also wanted to uh, bring people here in Ukraine who are the most influential and all uh, uh, stakeholders. And we would like to improve the discussion uh, around the reforms. One of the events uh, took place yesterday in Fox Ukraine Club. There was a group of people we uh, brought together representatives from civic groups and we discussed the, the most urgent uh, reform. And decentralization was one of them. And I would like to give the floor to Elena Bilan, and she will tell you about the event we had yesterday. Thank you very much. The idea of uh, the event yesterday and an open letter we would like uh, to present to you. We publish, we will publish uh, it later. The idea was we see that there is a feeling we feel that there is no feeling of urgency of reforms in Ukraine. There was a lot of talking, but not much done. Six, six months went, uh, went by after those uh, tragic events, and uh, but uh, there is nothing happening, or very little is happening. And we all understand that Ukraine goes through the most uh, difficult times, hard times uh, during these years of independence. There is the, uh, the war in the country, but the war should, must not become an obstacle to radical reforms. Me and my colleagues, uh, we hear very often from some representatives of the government, we cannot do anything because there is the war in the country. No, quite the opposite. Our answer is, here and in other cities of Ukraine that do not pa take part directly in, uh, in the war, they must work to improve our economy because the aggressor will use any weakness of us and they will try to destabilize our economy. Our answer must be we must strengthen our economy by any means and the most efficient me method is uh, reforms. What we what do we suggest? What do we call you for? We 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 tell you. We should not. We should not look for reasons why not to do. Or we should not look for excuses, but we should uh, work uh, quick. And for the reforms to start working, it's important to in in involve more people to the government, to government offices, and uh, to reduce the number of this time because uh, the government is like a bubble. And uh, also, the government should invite people with European uh, experience because uh, other initiatives will, will go slow or they will be sabotaged. In general, a list of reforms is very long. We can uh, we can speak about uh, how to define uh, priorities among them. It's not the main the major task. The task is uh, to involve as many people as possible who can do that, and we could start working on the reform. Uh, the approach should be systemic, because half steps will not change the situation. People and organizations who participated in our discussion yesterday. They are ready to provide maximal assistance, and uh, they can bring experts. And some of them are working already on some issues, and uh, they they do well. It's not only a position of Vox Ukraine, but also it's a, a position of NGOs, quite known NGOs like uh, Reanimation Package Package of Reforms and uh, representatives of New Country. They. Uh, they uh, participate in the discussion, the representatives uh, of uh, all an open dialogue, uh, business associations, European business associations supported these initiatives. Uh, this is the position of uh, uh, NGO activists. So this is a, a position of a broad, uh, broad public, and uh, I hope that we'll be heard and we'll be able to uh, talk quite efficiently and we'll be able to reform our country. Thank you.
Yuri, do you want to add anything? Yes, I agree with all. We work with uh, Vox Ukraine uh, quite closely, and uh, many of them were um, in uh, Kiev School of Economics. And we are sure that if we don't uh, push uh, fast and radically with the reforms among people, people will not be happy with the government, and uh, that will not help to stability. That's why it's very important that the government has holds the mission, which was given by people who who lost their life on Institutska Street and uh, in Kiev. It's very important that we will reform our country. We want to be in uh, Europe, but first of all, we should be Euro Europeans. We should have the form of governance, which is built on the same values like they have in the EU. And we have to move fast, and uh, then we'll cement, we will strengthen our country in this uh, fight for freedom and independence. Mr. Roger. As a, I'm sorry, as a foreigner from afar, a professor of economics, it's, it's my job, as I say, to make connections. This country is facing deep qu connect questions about, about politic, fundamental political reform, but it is also facing a deep military challenge to the existence of this country, and I would like to make a connection there. The question of defense of the sovereignty of Ukraine is a question of defending a political system. Ukraine, the people of Ukraine and the, the, the culture and language uh, have a, are, 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 are important, but, but the question of defense of the sovereignty of Ukraine is fundamentally a question of this, the existence of a sovereign political system. And, in the, and the forces that are mobilized uh, for its defense depend on people wanting to fight and sacrifice and risk their lives ultimately for to maintain the political system of this country. There are, dis there are of course, important discussions about making sure that the, 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 the courageous military forces of this country have the weapons that they need to defend the country. I want to suggest, although there are many reforms and it's not, and we can argue about what you're the highest priority, some aspect of reform is urgently needed as a weapon for the defense of the country. I want to suggest that one recognize that part of enabling the military and other forces to, uh, to be mobilized to defend the sovereign ex def existence of Ukraine relies on giving more people more faith that the political system of Ukraine is something that which genuinely will provide benefits for them in the long run and therefore is worth all those sacrifices. And in that sense, some part of reform, whether it's decentralization or some other aspect, should be considered by the, the nation and the leadership of this nation as being on the par of, of providing the, the weapons that are needed, the material that are needed to strengthen the, the forces that defend this country so with such courage and valor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Maestron, for pointing out this, the specific areas to the... Uh, uh, I would like uh, to express my personal opinion. Uh, it's not uh, an opinion of Fox Ukraine of other people. Uh, there will be nothing to defend if we don't uh, run reforms now. The country will just fall apart. And uh, soon there will be elections. And I see that political process brings to the fact that people are afraid of uh, reforms. They're waiting, they're playing, or they make deals with each other on uh, political coalitions in the next uh, parliament. That's why I don't want to... to to swing the system, they don't want it to risk uh, the agreements. But our neighbor who is trying to press us down, to strangle us, they will use these uh, elections and they will use absence of reforms uh, to prove to people in, uh, with inform in information uh, warfare that nothing has changed with the new government. Uh, if they prove that to people and uh, 
if they see that it's uh, not only they speak only about new uh, coalitions in the parliament, but in six or seven months nothing has changed. They just still take bribes. Bureaucrats uh, still stop the process of uh, providing weapons uh, to our armed forces. They are afraid to, to take responsibility for weeks. And if people see that, and that nobody will want to defend the country, but because. Uh, what to defend if the same, uh, just the same co uh, quality of people uh, replaced uh, the previous uh, ruling uh, group? So the Russia wants to prove that uh, democracy brings uh, nothing. They just oligarchs replace all oligarchs. If Russia can prove that, if they can prove that, and then we'll have no democracy, we'll have no country. That's why I believe that we should run reforms now. And political elite and oligarchs, and they have no other chance uh, but just uh, to take chance and responsibility and uh, run their phone. It's not important what they do, but they should must uh, do something. For people to see changes by 20, uh, you see, it doesn't matter what they do, something should change. If not, nothing changes except uh, people uh, die, for Ukraine, then I don't understand what's happening in the country. Should the the government should understand and they should mobilize to defend uh, physically the country, but uh, they should defend the country politically. That's why we need uh, reforms urgently. Allah now wants to add. I would like to add uh, to Temafi's words that. Uh, uh, we have similar feeling and similar signals which we received from our servicemen. Actually, B uh, Donbass Battalion servicemen expressed very similar ideas. They say that nothing is improving, nothing new is going on in the country, and they want to push up these uh, changes. Uh, uh, in a moment, we will shift to Q&A session, and uh, as a moderator, I would like to ask a question about the latest uh, things which you discussed. Since we are going to have parliamentary elections in October, and the, this election campaign and voting will be held in line with the old election system, how do you think, with under all these circumstances, won't this fact hinder um, the reforms, is there any threat that we will have the same faces in the parliament and whether we can expect uh, them to vote for reforms? I do not believe that all the reforms should be voted in the parliament. I believe that we can start reforms uh, just now. I uh, uh, I am very much convinced that we should immediately ruin this corruption system, uh, this so-called telephone rule, when it is enough to call somebody who is in power and to offer a bribe, and your issue will be resolved. Uh, actually, Ukrainian constitution uh, is excellent. It, it provides for many, many good things and for many, many rights for the citizens. And uh, this suggests that this is not the legislation which should be changed. We should change the real structure of power. And uh, uh, the legal structure of, power, of power will be changed in the parliament, but we should start changing the real structure of power at the level of society, at the level of business, at the level of broad public. This uh, civil society should be honest and it should get rid of corruption itself. And actually, today we witness how this broad public has started to clear it up and to change. And that's why I believe that even today, both the president, the government have all necessary means, tools, instruments to uh, uh, take reform and to implement reforms today. 
Actually, they do not need so much new legislation. If the parliament does not want to work, the country should go forward anyway. Actually, uh, in other words, you suggest that uh, if there is political will, then we can change everything today. It's Roger Myerson. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm a PhD in economy uh, from uh, Donetsk National University, working for Ukrainian Crisis Media Center, a uh, spin off project uh, by, for communicating the reforms. And my question is about where is the balance between the quick wins that the Ukrainian economy and Ukrainian people expected and the strategy development that the government is arguing? Uh, I'm sorry, the, what is the, as the, as the, the last sentence again? Yeah, the, my question is where the, like how to find the balance between the quick wins that the people are expecting right now, the urgency for reform, and the development of the strategy, of the vision, what to reform, how to reform, because the government officials saying, we're developing the strategy right now, and it is impossible to have the quick wins until we uh, see where we are going. So I've tried to argue that a well-crafted reform, fundamental political reform, should be viewed as part of the strategy for, for achieving uh, it, it reintegration of every part of this, of this country and effectively into, the, into a sovereign unity. Um, I have argued that, that a decentralization which could be achieved very quickly by, in, in some aspect of it could be achieved very quickly simply as, as the president has promised by allow, by under the constitution, the current president, the president can select anyone to be a head of government in a province or district, but there's nothing to prevent him from accepting the rule that uh, a provincial, that he will appoint whoever is, 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 has the vote of confidence of a majority of the provincial or district council, even if they vote for someone who's in a party opposed to him. That's a rule which I understand he has promised to start implementing after the next provincial elections. That seems like a quick win. He could do it even quicker by using the uh, tomorrow, by or this afternoon, by making appointments of, of, of those councils where they are functioning. Uh, they already exist. Um, the there, th what the people of this country want can only be achieved in the long term. We understand that. Uh, a proof, the proof that business is being, that business as usual is over and that things are being done differently can be done. That is the quick win you're, re you're referring to. Uh, a journey requires a first step and a journey that is a, re, a, real, a redefinition of the distribution of power in a country needs to begin with a step that is costly. Uh, the, uh, in, uh, if decentralization is to be the reform, the first step should be uh, giving up control, uh, central control of the local bureaucracies, and that could be done very quickly. Uh, in other dimensions, it's, I, I, I can't speak. If, if other reforms are given priority, I wanted to argue earlier that some tangible reform that is fundamental to the power structure, whether it's decentralization or on some other dimension of government, uh, should be viewed as a, high, as a high priority. Let me just add to that, if I may. Uh, because the Kiev School of Economics, uh, together with uh, other uh, agencies and donors uh, does a lot of policy work uh, and as we've this is our experience uh, so far we've worked with a number of ministries uh, and it turns out that in every ministry there's no one to do the necessary work to prepare reforms reforms aren't just simply uh, kind of you may we wave the magic wand and it happens it's a, it's a human capital issue and and so uh, ministers bring outside people who come in and work as volunteers or who get some support through donor organizations in order to design reforms that will work because you can easily be populist and create anything you want and then uh, have a disaster afterwards. Reforms have to work in the way you want them to work. They can't work perversely. 
And that takes time, it's not easy to do. And the capital is missing. In every single ministry, for, for understandable reasons, you have people who are not reform oriented, who have no concept of what reform should do, who've been doing things for decades in the same old way. The inheritance of the Soviet Union has been passed on in the cabinet of ministers to a new generation who work with, in the same way. Uh, and so you need uh, all of the drive for reform and the reformers are outside of government. They're outside of parliament. And so we hope that uh, with the new elections, uh, we will have uh, new members of parliament and a new cabinet minister that will be formed uh, that will be able to drive these reforms effectively. But the new ministers, just as the current ministers, and they may be the very same persons, will, never, will still not be able to affect reforms until you do a massive civil service reform until you evaluate civil servants for their ability, for their intent, for their education, uh, so that they can be drivers of reform. And of course, you need a much smaller government apparatus. We know that what we've inherited is a result of central planning uh, and, and, a, and a, uh, author, a totalitarian political system. You don't need this huge civil service. You don't need all of these government employees. You need quality, and that should happen. There's some effort at moving that direction, but you can't simply take and fire half of your ministry. They're protected. So you need civil service reform. Uh, and you need to bring fresh blood in. Uh, otherwise, civil society will always be driving reform and always frustrated. And the citizenry will always be disappointed. And uh, the, th the wasted 20 years we have could turn into another wasted 20 years. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have another question. Um, Sergio Cantone from Euronews, I'm a journalist. Um, I'm interested uh, because there is, anyway, a central issue now in Ukraine, which is the Donbass one, is uh, also one of the origins of the conflict. And uh, there are talks about, of course, uh, the centralization concerning especially this, uh, this region. Uh, but there is also a, a, a very important, a huge, uh, huge reforming effort uh, to take on in the Donbass. Uh, so what kind of reform, of economic reform, do you think the Donbass region need? Uh, and whether Ukraine, uh, an economic reform in, in Ukraine, a comprehensive one, is viable without reforming the Donbass system? Thank you very much. I can just answer that briefly. We know that Donbass is basically, in, in its current economic structure and political structure, is basically an extension of the Soviet period. People there live frozen in a different period of time, and its sense of a different reality has been reinforced by TV and uh, media from, uh, from the neighboring country, as we know. So Donbass needs uh, to understand for the first time what freedom is, what liberty is, the ability to choose, to have a choice. If you're a worker in a giant metallurgical enterprise that has 50,000 or 100,000 employees, you have no choice. You go to work, you earn your, your, your wage, you come home, you watch TV and you go to bed. Uh, the Donbass region needs to have, and you can see this, the signs of this, uh, a, a balanced economy, a balanced society with a strong middle class, with small and medium business uh, flourishing. In fact, it is this small and medium business uh, that, uh, and, and the middle class that has supported the Ukrainian government in Donbass. And it is the huge metallurgical and heavy machinery enterprises uh, that have been the lethargic uh, remnant of the past. So, uh, and these are subsidized industries, incidentally. Uh, everybody cynically argues that if these industries were to collapse, the, the state budget could be reallocated for, for the useful needs. Uh, so a massive transformation, economic, social, political, has to be done in bus. People have to feel that they have uh, authority, that they have democracy, that they have a voice, that they can make decisions, and it's no longer made by, by the owner of a huge plant or by a single monopolized political party, such as the party of regions was in Donbass. The, the, one of the problems of Ukraine is that um, Ukraine, uh, unlike the United States, doesn't have national political parties. They're highly regionalized. And the Party of Regions was a highly regionalized party. Uh, 
And incidentally, uh, the, the president of, of, uh, uh, of Ukraine, uh, the last one, uh, who was extremely effective in introducing an authoritarian system, who knew how to use the levers of power, gained his experience as a governor of Donbass. And this goes back to Roger's point, that we need to have the centralization also so that we can have schools uh, that, uh, that regions or oblasts can become schools for executive training for, for future presidents, governors who become presidents. We all laugh about Ronald Reagan. Remember Ronald Reagan, Hollywood actor who became a great president? Well, he was governor of California. An extremely important experience, the, the most, perhaps one of the most important, if not the most important states uh, in, in the Union. Uh, so we, we need to have uh, future presidents, we need to have executives in, 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 in public uh, in, in administration and government uh, who are responsive to people. We need to, have, we need to have people understand that government serves them. You know, this, this concept of we citizens uh, want a strong state so we can serve the state. It's absolutely wrong. A strong state is needed to serve people. That's what government is for. That's what the state is for. And people in Donbass don't know that. In other parts of Ukraine, they don't, but there particularly they don't. So I think these are the kinds of changes that have to be made uh, in the future in Donbass and throughout Ukraine. Yeah, but the, the, aren't, aren't you afraid that uh, this uh, decentralization that is being talked about now is not going to tackle really the economic reforms that are badly needed in uh, the, in Donbas, as you said. And second point, don't you aren't you afraid that Donbas could become a kind of uh, Wallonia? I don't know whether you know the case in Belgium, uh, where in the 70s there was this industrial reconversion, and uh, it was a region of mining and uh, steel making factories that were not economically viable then. Uh, aren't you afraid about this uh, negative, uh, possible negative outcome in this case? Can I, I, I would like to comment on this. So, <coughs> oh. uh, English is okay? Uh, okay, okay, so, so let's, um, let's just be honest about this. We need to, first we don't know what's gonna happen in Donbass in terms of the final outcome in terms of the structure of the power. Will it eventually become separate? Will it become a part of Ukraine where the central government has absolutely no control, where they have special powers? Will there be really honest elections within the local uh, councils or areas? All of those questions have to be resolved. There are very unpleasant scenarios which might realize and uh, there is a little chance, there is some chance, but not very high that there will be a pleasant scenario in terms of go final governance structure. Once that is uh, clear, one could think about what is the economic prospects. Ideally, we should be preparing for all possible outcomes right now and have strategies in place that when there is an opportunity to move in and uh, do something about economics too, then we are ready and we don't start thinking for the ne next six months about what we're gonna do now. But, honestly, we have to make a decision. Is this going to be a region that's worth developing? being cynical about it. Let's look at historically, uh, do we know of regions where there have been conflicts of this scale uh, which, have which have been redeveloped successfully? And what is the international experience tells us? Is it, is it easier for us to relocate everyone, including industries and people, um, or is it easier for us to recover the industries and infrastructure. If we recover the industries, do we want to recover the industries which were there or do we want to create new industries? So these kind of questions which are not easy questions because they are related to redistribution of power and they can generate new conflicts among people. Some people are stand to gain from this and some people are stand to lose. It's easy to say we want to de redevelop, uh, we want to develop uh, um, small medium enterprises but of course miners will be hurting if we are not paying them subsidies. If we are not paying them subsidies they will be easily, uh, you know, there will be demand for populist policies. Whether they will be pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian or pro-Belgium it's unclear but someone might capitalize on that. So this is an extremely difficult question which need to be taken seriously and I sort of agree with you that the best we can do right now is to raise them and we need to think seriously okay. about them but there are no easy answers. Yes. Thank you. These political decentral 
Political decentralization and the questions of economic reform are in some sense logically separate issues. I understand. I, I cannot claim to be to have expertise on, on on the Donbass economy. I understand that there have been a number of industrial enterprises there that have given many people there a, 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 a better than average income, and that's that's a good thing. That's good for the welfare of those people, and 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 Ukrainians should be glad of, of that. But I understand that those, those industries may depend actually on, on a variety of subsidies, subsidies from the public uh, 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 budget of, of Ukraine, subsidies of below global prices on energy inputs that may ultimately be subsidies from Russia to, to Ukraine and to that region in particular. If the, if the public budget is being spent in Ukraine to, to maintain industries uh, that the, both the, the, the owners and the workers of these industries have some benefits, but if the benefits are unfairly are considered at the, you know, the spent, spending general funds that belong to everyone in Ukraine to support those industries, if they are truly, and I cannot say they are, but if they are truly dependent on such subsidies, then it is entirely appropriate to question those subsidies. If you have a totally centralized political system where it happens that the national government is controlled by a popular coalition elected by a majority of Ukrainians votes, but majority that happens to be based in the western part of the country. And, and one of the uh, plans for economic reform to spend the, public, the scarce public funds more efficiently is to cut off the subsidies that maintain uh, the economy of the Donbass region. I can imagine that, that if there hadn't already been uh, the kind of, 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 of dangerous separatism that we already saw, it could be created by such discussions. So, uh, so the ability to make economic reforms that cut subsidies in, in a crucial region may be politically easier once there is a genuine decentralization so that they can be guaranteed that if, even if this loss is there, that some part of the public budget is being spent be, through the fact of decentralization by people who have been elected to office through the confidence of the citizen of the residents of that region. So I would argue, while in some sense they are logically separate and decentralization does not force economic reform of this sort, that political decentralization in the long term may make this kind of economic reform more feasible. Let me, let me just add that the Donbass region has been a probably the most uniquely non-transparent region in Ukraine. And economists, uh, including our economists at the Kiev School of Economics, in response to our own curiosity and questions from others, have, been, have tried to take a look and to understand what is the pro real profitability of industries uh, which were uh, subsidized, uh, and we don't know to what extent, and in which profits were not uh, properly calculated, and, uh, and huge amounts of money uh, was transferred offshore from these industries that, uh, so, so we, don't, we don't understand, number one, what really is uh, happening in Donbass, and I think that uh, we soon will, I'm one of those people who believes that everything will end up well, and, and, and that uh, uh, the Euro European borders will not change. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, we understand Ukraine also needs uh, major infrastructural changes, uh, upgrades, uh, development. Uh, if you try to drive on the roads of Ukraine uh, or travel as a passenger on the railroads of Ukraine, you understand the bad uh, infrastructure. And, and that will require a considerable uh, labor force. Uh, since these are uh, considerably uh, highly manual labor intensive uh, efforts uh, so that I think that a developing flourishing Ukraine will be able to absorb uh, any workforce uh, that is uh, laid off from industries that are truly a, dis a, a disaster. Uh, in Wallonia, uh, that, that was a problem. You, you had a, a highly developed economy and there, there wasn't much absorbability uh, for the labor force. In Ukraine, there was enormous absorbability of, uh, of, of potential labor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are extremely pressed in time, so we have to finish. Thank you so much, Mr. Meyerson, for making it up to us. Mr. Logush, uh, dear colleagues from the Fox Ukraine, we hope to see, a meaningful, to see you again here and to have another meaningful discussion. And thank you so much again for your time. Шановні yeah. колеги, ми наш наступний прес-брифінг вже проводимо через дві хвилини на тему волонтерської допомоги бійцям в зоні АТО. Всім, хто зацікавлений, дуже прошу розвернути ваші стільці, бо спікер буде знову з того боку. Дякую.